Uh, that being said, again, thank you for coming. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Bernie Geisel, whose family has been farming here in Door County for 125 plus years now. And he's going to give us a history of the Geisel family. Bernie? Hey. Thank you, Don. I've been asked to have all the relatives of the Geisel family just to stand up for just a second. Okay. Okay, hello. My name is Bernard Geisel. It's 2013 and I'm going to take you on a, to a long time ago with my wonderful Geisel family. I'm 74 years old and I am the oldest living branch in a Geisel tree. I find it to be my duty to document what I know and to establish a foundation of our family for the future descendants to build upon. Fortunately, I have some verification as to where they came from and also some valuable photos. <coughs> they are very old, but they will aid in reconstruction their lifestyles. Since I am not a polished speaker, nor have I any public speaking experience, I'll use for a guide the same words that is written on a sign that's nailed to my daughter's Jamie Henschel sawmill shed. It reads, this ain't no Burger King. You, you, you don't get it your way. You're going to get it my way or you don't get it at all. Okay, okay this is the Geisel family farm in 1915. Looking uh, right down Clark's Lake Road to the east. And that's the way it is, looks today. Okay. Okay. This is my... This is my grandpa and grandma Geisel. That's Hermann Geisel Sr. He was born in Doblin, Providence of Saxony, Germany on Christmas Day in 1856. And he died here in August 1921. His oldest son William told me, Bernard, that Hermann Sr. was a logger for a company on Washington Island. He fell trapped on the island, so one night in the spring before the ice broke up, he and two other men walked across the ice on the mainland. Somehow he ended up in Algoma area where he met and he married Anna Pavlik in 1886. They then bought 80 acres in the town of Sevastopol section one on Clark's Lake Road. I asked Uncle Bill if, he, if his dad ever wrote letters to his family in Germany. He said he did. He said he did, but when, when uh, he told them that he'd bought 80 acres, the letters stopped. Presumably, they thought he'd lost his mind because in Germany, owning that much land would only have been a dream. Together, Herman Sr. and Anna had four children. They were William, born in uh, 1888. He died in 1971. Hulda, born in 1890 and died in 1949. Herman Jr. was born in 1897 and died in 1973. And lastly, Emil, which was my dad. He was born in 1900 and he died in 1959. Okay. Next. Okay, this is my great grandpa and grandma, Casper and Josephine Pavlik. That was my grandma Geisel's mother and dad. <coughs> Casper was born in 1832 and died in 1916 at 83 years old. His wife, Josephine Bunda, born in 1846 and died in, in 1923. They were both born in Pilsen, Bohemia. They had three children born in Bohemia. Anna on 1865, Frank in 1869, and Mary uh, we don't know when she, what year she was born. And, uh, and in 1870, they came to Wisconsin. They bought farmland northeast of Kohlberg on Curve Road. Um, and then tragedy struck their family. 
their oldest, must, I'm sure it was their oldest girl, Mary, she was, uh, went to see her friends just down the road a half a mile, and uh, the, it got to be smoky and very hot, and she got scared, and she wanted to go home. And she ran home, but she didn't make it. That was, a, that was a, when the Peshtigo fire went through. But the, at, the, at that time, in that area, they called it the Brussels fire, and she died. She, they found her dead the next day. And, but they, uh, their house burnt down at that time, too, and they were very devastated. But uh, they regrouped, and they knew they had to get over it, and uh, they rebuilt the house, and, and after that, they had three more children. Catherine was born in 1874, and she married Joe Plutz, and she died in 1965. And then she had <coughs> two more sons, Albert, born in 1876, and Emil Pavlik in 1878. Uh, they farmed in Colberg area on Curve Road, and they had a nice farm, and then later on, uh, their son, their oldest son, Frank, took over the farm, and his wife, Mary, and they farmed, and then when they got older, they, they moved up to Sevastopol. They lived on Lyst Road. And uh, when, when Casper died in 1921, I believe it is, uh, then Josephine went to live with her son, Albert. And uh, let's see. And Frank Pavlik was running the, fa the, the homestead of the Pavliks, and then, it went, then he turned it over to his son, Tony and his wife B. They had four children, Bob Pavlik, and David, and Jerry, and Jeannie. And Bob still retains some of the, the acreage, and, and David still has some of the acreage, but the original homestead was sold to a different person. And Jeannie Pavlik uh, built a home just to the south of the homestead, and she's married to Terry Wiegan. Okay, <coughs> and that's my dad on the left, Emil, and Herman, my Uncle Herman, sitting down. <laughs> and my dad was born in 1900, so well, you can guess about how old he is. Okay, and that's my Uncle Herman. That he he just he always when he wanted to see a picture of Herman, that's the one he always wanted to be shown with because yeah. it was the time I guess he was uh, being drafted, and they took a picture, and he was proud of it. And when he was drafted, he got as far as uh, in Milwaukee, and then he was told that there was an armistice size, sign that he was able to come home. And I guess he was really overjoyed. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, that's my Aunt Hulda. That's my dad's sister. And uh, as a young girl. Okay. Uh, that's, uh, well, that's my Uncle Bill, the, the tall one. And uh, his daughter, his uh, his sister Hulda, and my uncle Herman, the little guy. Okay, and here's where Joe and Bocek, Joe Bocek married my aunt Hulda, Hulda Geisel, and I think it was about 1913, if I'm not mistaken. And then they moved to Saskatchewan, Canada, after they got married, and this is their first first home up in on the prairies of Saskatchewan, located. Uh, <coughs> near Hodgeville, Hodgeville, Saskatchewan. And the, the two boys sitting on the porch, that's uh, their two oldest sons, Roy and Floyd. And it's been said about that they were there, and uh, Joe Bocek, he was supposed to get to a, a thrashing. They were thrashing out in the prairie, and he was late in getting there. And he had hitched up his team and his, his wagon, and uh, he was raced through the yard to get there. And he got too close to the corner of the house, and he caught the corner of the kitchen, and, Spilt the dishes and tipped the fenders, tipped the pictures off the wall. It was not a, not a happy day for Hulda. I don't think it was a happy night for Joe either. So, <laughs> okay. Okay, this is uh, the Geisel's first car, 1917 Model T Ford. They bought it from uh, Ham Paul in, in, in Velmi. And uh, that's my Uncle Bill at the, at the driver's seat there and two of his cousins, two of the Plutzes in the back. The guys on a motorcycle, I do not know. So, okay. Okay, here's my dad. He went to Canada to live with his sister, and uh, he's working up there. He's got a six-horse hitch. He's pulling an 18-foot harrow, and uh, that, 
the boy uh, standing on the wheel is uh, my dad's nephew. That was uh, Floyd, Floyd Bocek. Okay. And this here is the rig it said on the back of the picture that he had plowed 160 acres with it last summer. It's a six horse hitch. Okay, and here's my dad in fair different times up there. He worked for uh, a guy that was boring a well, not drilling a well, boring it. They dropped, they didn't have rocks like we do out here. <laughs> but the cylinder went down and then there was an auger inside there that would fill up the, the cylinder with, with ground and then they'd pull that back up and clean it all out and then drink it back down again until they got down to water. That's what that was. Okay. That's the, that's John Scheidel up in, up in Saskatchewan, and that's his Model T. And uh, he's the one that my dad worked for with the, with the steam engines and, and, uh, and the thrash machine. Okay. Okay, there's the rig he worked on. But at first he didn't work on the engine or the thrash machine, my dad didn't. He was, uh, he was just a, a spiker. He'd go, he had to go load up his load of bundles. They give him a team and a wagon. And you were expected at that time to load and unload six to eight loads a day by yourself. And my dad was getting nosebleeds. And John Scheidel seen that. And he says, uh, I, you can't go on like that. I need somebody to help me on the, on the separator and on the, on the engine. So he asked my dad to, to uh, help him there. And that was a little bit not such pressure work. So. Okay, and here's the engine he was running up there. Uh, a case, 75 horse. Mm -hmm. Okay, here he's, here he's running the engine. You can, he's on the left there. He's, they fire it. They fire it with straw. There, there's no trees up in Saskatchewan, and straw was free. And he said, well, there was like, like a big straw chute on the engine, and you'd shove straw in there until you start seeing the the smoke coming out of it. Then that was time to shove another wad in. And they kept the pressure up that way. Kept the fire burning. Okay, here's a threshing scene. You can see that the elevator going way up high with the scale on top. They didn't bag up their grain. What they did, they had little, uh, little granaries, maybe uh, uh, 10 feet wide and maybe 15 feet long. And they'd pull them alongside of the engine, I mean alongside the separator, and then they'd had the long spout run the grain right into the granary. <coughs> and then in the winter time, they'd go out there with their, with their horses and sleigh and pitch the, shovel the stuff on their, on their sleigh and then haul it into the town for sale. But it just shows that all the people that got to work there. Okay? And here's just a closer, closer picture than the other one. Okay. That's my dad on the bottom kneeling. He's always the dirtiest one in the bunch. <laughs> but he was, he was firing the engine. And that day, my dad said it was so windy, they kept, they kept switching the machine around to, get, to have the wind be favorable to him. But it did, as soon as they get it switched, the wind would shift again. And they'd do it again. And finally, John Scheidel said, that's enough. We're going to shut her down for the day. And they took this picture. You can see how windy the one guy's hanging onto his cap. And even the dog, look at his ears blowing away. OK. Okay, then after threshing season was over, uh, up in Saskatchewan, there isn't that much to do. They don't have dairy cows to speak of, and uh, it gets to be a kind of a slack time. So him and another guy, they went out to British Columbia in the, in the logging woods. And that's my dad on the right there. That's over, overseeing the camp. And he worked there in the wintertime. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is a sprinkler. It's a, it's a big wooden tank on a sleigh. And you'd, uh, you'd take it down to the river and fill it up with water. What they did then, they, you, you worked at night, all night long. And uh, while it was good and cold, so it would free, then you, when you got the thing full, but you, what you, how you fill it, you drop the barrel out down a slide into the, into the river, then you pull it up with one of the horses and dump it in and get another barrel full until it got full. Then you'd go out on the logging roads and you'd uh, open up the, the bungs and let it sprinkle out to make ice. And uh, he worked all night, and then in the morning he could come home and have breakfast, and then he was expected to go to bed. But he said he couldn't, he couldn't sleep very long. 
because you'd hear the blacksmith pounding down on the anvil, and so he'd walk, he'd get up and he'd walk down there and help them, help in the blacksmith shop a little bit. Then he started thinking, up where I where he loads that that tank up, it was very slippery, it was all icy, and then it got wet and water, and you you had to be very careful, and you couldn't see just with a lantern. And then he started talking, thinking, them horses they got ice cleats on their on their shoes, and they can walk around fine. So he thought, by God, if I if I can fashion a little pair of horseshoes with, with ice cleats on my, on my boots, I could probably do that too. So he did. And uh, yeah, he said it was like night and day. I could walk around that ice like it was bare ground. And then he got, then spring started coming. And uh, well, the trails were starting to break up. So he, the boss took him off the, the sprinkler and said, you can go back to help him load logs and stuff. And uh, well, they are coming in from the, going back, going at me for supper, and uh, this big Swede, he says, hey, Emil, you know, all winter long, he says, I, I, I wrestled everybody in the camp, and I beat every one of them, but I never had a chance to wrestle you because you were always out in that sprinkler. How about you and I have a little wrestle, and then I can say I beat you, I can say I, I'm the undefeated champion of the camp, and my dad says, no, there was no way in, Hell, he could beat that guy. And then the other loggers start chanting, come on, Emil, come on, Emil. And uh, geez. Well, then my dad spotted over in the, in the yard there, there was a <coughs> ice had formed, and there was a little water on top of it. And he thought, my God, I got these cleats on my shoes. <laughs> he said, how about we wrestle out in the middle of that ice pond? Oh, and the loggers, they thought that was a great idea. So. Uh, well, the Swede agreed to, and they went out there. And my dad said, all I had to do was shimmy around a little bit, get them off balance, and I, I dropped them. And <laughs> <laughs> that was it. OK. And I asked him, did, uh, was the Swede mad that you did that? No. He said, it, all the loggers were friendly. We had no, never no problem up there. I said, did you tell them, I did, I, did you tell them that you had, them, had the advantage with them, with them cleats on your shoes? And I'm sure he, he didn't tell them. Because if he'd have told him, I don't think I'd be here today. <laughs> okay. Okay, here's the here's guys in the logging camp. My dad is the fourth one on the left up there. And, uh, okay, here's uh, after, he, after he goes off the sprinkler, then they put him on jobs like this. They were, they had the, that's the log jammer there to, to pick up the logs and load them on the sleigh. Okay, yeah, here's another picture of it. Here's a load of logs. You can see where, where he sprinkled the ice on the road. It's just there. The rest of it start, looks like it's starting to melt, and it's just the ice left. That it can still haul a little bit yet. And there it must be spring coming on. And he's probably just sitting there on a Sunday afternoon. You can see the snow is gone around the place. And I suppose it's getting ready to, for the camp to break up. And... Uh, He's just sitting there, I imagine, pondering about how things went this last winter and also what it's going to be like when he gets back to the prairie. Okay. Okay, he got back to the prairie. That's his brother-in-law and my uncle, Joe Bocek. And uh, that's my dad on, sitting on the, on the bench there and uh, turning the crank. They didn't have no electricity, but they were shearing the winter hair off the horse. My dad would turn the crank, and Joe was, was shearing, it, shearing it off, you can see. Okay. Okay, here they're planting their wheat. My dad must have took the picture because he's not on it. And he's, he's, got, he's driving that, team, that hitch there with the 18 foot of harrow before the drill. Okay. Then he came back to, this is a picture of, uh, they're thrashing at the homestead in, on, sec, on Clark's Lake Road on, in section one. And the, the Zettel brothers are trashing, Hans and Rudolph, I believe it is. And that's my grandpa a little bit further back with the beard on. And, and uh, that's one of the last pictures they took of him because he died very shortly after that. And uh, then my dad run this engine after a while, too. OK. Oh, here's my family. That's. Uh, my grandma Geisel on the bottom left, my aunt Hulda on the, on the right bottom, 
And then Uncle Herman is up in the back left, Uncle Bill is in the middle, and my dad is on the right. And that's, uh, that's a picture of the Geisel Farmstead. Okay, there's my dad running the, the, the steamer for the Zettel brothers. I think uh, that's the engine he wanted to buy and to separate. He wanted to sell it to him later on. And, and the, my Uncle Bill says, no, he says, it needs, it needs a lot of repair. And, and, if, and, and McCormick Durian's come out with a good 1530 now. And they're uh, coming out with an all steel thresher. He said, Let's, we'll, buy the, we'll buy a new rig and then we, won't, we, can, we can thresh. And then we can use it for plowing and for other work around the farm. OK. Oh, here's my Uncle Bill butchering a pig. And uh, <coughs> well, the Geisels knew how to survive. They, you, had a, you had to do what you got to do. And then they, uh, my grandma, she had a big garden. She knew how to can. And, uh, and they, they, uh, winter was a good time to butcher because they could uh, there was no flies or nothing, nothing around, no dust, and you could freeze the meat. You could, and they had a smokehouse. They had the men had more time to tend the smokehouse for, for, um, with their bacon's and sausage they made and stuff. And, and uh, that's uh, that hound on the left down there. That was Herman's hound. They said he could go down the swamp and catch a rabbit and bring it home live. <laughs> what he did with it after that. I don't know. Oh, back up once then. Yeah, you can see his, his ears were so long that my grandma Geisel, she made a piece of cloth that she could tie his ears back when she fed him <laughs> milk and dish. Now, if that, if that picture offends anybody, if there's anybody near from the animal rights group, I can rest your mind in the comfort zone again when I tell you, if animals weren't meant to eat, they, God wouldn't have made them out of meat. That's my dad with a team of horses. OK, that, that's, the, that's the threshing machine that the Geisel brothers bought. They bought that rig brand thing and new. And uh, they did a lot of threshing with it. And you don't think threshing isn't always a clean job. The 1530 there is laboring away all she can do. And the thrash machine is sitting back in there. You can hardly see it. But the dust and the wind and the chaff is blowing around. And that's the way it was. There's another, another set of it at a different location. One year they trashed, started trashing in August, and they ended up on Halloween night. Spent a lot of, lot of time. OK, then 1934, my dad and mother got married. And uh, that's my uncle Ernest, my mother's brother on the left, and the other people I don't know. And, uh, well, I can see my dad cleaned up. <laughs> yep, there they are again. I think the car is a 1933 Chevrolet. Okay, they're thrashing here right across the road from my place where I live now, on Brower Road. <coughs> and it appears to me that the, the Plutz family came over to visit when they got to the house and they said, uh, my mother and my grandma must have said that they're thrashing over by for Harry Hayne. So I suppose they said, well, let's go over, and see, over there and see how things are going. Well, that's, they did. And then you can see my Uncle Herman's on the left, and one of the plutes is on the, the tall guy with the white clothes on. Then my uh, Katie Plutes, that was my, my grandma's sister, then my dad and mother, then my grandma Geisel. <coughs> And Joe Plutes and Simon Plutes and Mar Martha Plutes. The rest of the people I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> Here they must have got done grinding feed. They had the tractor all warmed up, and they apparently wanted to uh, break a hole over to the car shed so they could go to town. They're breaking, breaking a hole through the snow through the snowbank. Uncle Bill is watching them. Okay. That was the days before snow blowers and snow plows. <clears throat> That's the 33 Chevrolet. They must have chains on the back and knobby tires and going out.
I need to drink a water. <clears throat> okay, okay. Here's here's me and Gert. We're just playing on the on the snowbank. That's Uncle Hermit. He's down in Clark's Lake fishing. Okay, here's a <clears throat> load of hay in the 27 Chevrolet truck. That's a load of bales that they you bale in the barn with the stationary hay press like we do with the treasury, and then haul them to wherever they're going to sell them. It could have been to, a, to a, somebody around the neighborhood or else could be down to Sturgeon Bay to a railroad car. <coughs> That's just another picture of the, the same truck with Moose on. And they bought this 37 Chevrolet, which I still got, with a load of, well, that's a load of oats on there that they're gonna, gonna sell. See that big load. <clears throat> okay, here they're crushing stones behind the, behind the sheds. And the reason I put this one, it's not a great picture, but uh, my dad is on the left, Herman's in the middle, and Uncle Bill is on the right. <clears throat> but I want you to see that, that old truck it's an old international truck in the 19, from the 1920s, and it had no, no cab, no fenders, no windows, no doors, <clears throat> but it was, <clears throat> it was Uncle Bill's truck. And when he took it someplace, me and my sister Gert had to, had to get a ride on it. And uh, <clears throat> this one particular day, he had to go back to the Strand Farm and get some uh, lumber. lumber. <coughs> Jeez. And, uh, so we got a ride with him. He went out the driveway, up the road, down the Strand Road, and back to the Strand Barn. And he got his lumber. And on the way home, he decided to come a different way. He decided to come through the field. And uh, then he got by the corn patch, and he says he's going to stop here, and he's going to pick up some, some cobs that he thinks are mature enough to have corn on the cob tonight for supper. And he told me and Gert to stay in the truck. Well, he come back with his arm full of corn cobs, and he looked at Gert and he says, where's Bernard? Well, she said he, he walked into the corn patch. And Bill told me at a later date, he was just hysterical. He didn't know how he was going to find me. And he hollered and hollered and called. And I'm sure he was praying and swearing at the same time. And uh, well, then he said Gert, Gert tried to comfort him. She told him, don't worry about him, Uncle Bill. You'll find them when you cut the corn. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, this is the, the man in the back to the left. That's uh, Emil Pavlik. That's Grandma's sister, uh, Grandma's brother. And uh, <clears throat> the other guy is Albert. That's Grandma's brother also. And then on, way on the left is Bertha. That'd be Emil's wife. And the other lady on the left would be um, Lena. The one on the right, I don't know. <clears throat> Here they're back in the back 80, back on the, off a of tower. Well, I should say across from Henschel's Orchard somewhere there. They're breaking up new land that's never been plowed with a, <clears throat> with a breaker plow in a 1530. That's Herman on the tractor, my dad on the plow. And, and Bill uh, doing whatever he's got to do. Okay, here's their, their horses. <coughs> the one in the middle you've seen before when, it was on the, when he was on the plow. And the other two, I think, are waiting to get big enough to get the harnesses on. Okay. Okay, here they got the harnesses on now. And that was the last team the Geisels had. Their names were Prince and Nellie. Okay, here's my dad. Her Herman's on the 1530 on the left. He's pulling an Oliver disc plow. And my dad's on the 816 uh, pulling a John Deere manure spreader. He must have did some work on the 816 because he got the hoods taken off. And I suppose he's going <coughs> to adjust the valves or something, then he'll put them back on. Okay, and here every spring, the Bill always had some building project to do. And he would uh, <coughs> get the saw, they'd log all winter in a swamp. And then he'd get a sawmill a portable sawmill come in and, uh, and uh, saw the logs. I believe that's August Wilkie and that's our 1530 on the, 
Og når så... Okay. Oh, here's me and Shirley. That's my... <laughs> that's my 816. The other 816 I've never seen. But, uh, and I always was yearning to find one, and they're very hard to find. And then one day, uh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, I was uh, we come in for, I brought the mail in for a dinner time, and I was just paging through a fast line magazine, and there was a picture of an 816 for sale. I called the guy right away. He was down in La Myra. And <coughs> I said, I'm going down there this weekend to my daughter in Milwaukee, and uh, I'd like to look at it. I told him I'm a serious buyer, and if it's what I want, I'll, I'm going to buy it. And uh, so he held it for me. I got down there, and he was a very nice person. I made a deal, and that's mine. That's, uh, that tractor, I believe, is brand spanking new. It's a Farmo F12 and a, a new Grandville. They, they always had a, pl a plant with horses before, but this is the first tractor-driven one. And uh, <clears throat> that's my dad on the, on the green mill and my sister Gertie. And here's Her Herman, he's cultivating corn. He took meticulous work with that corn. He liked, he liked to work with the corn. Oh, <laughs> this is Jim. Jim the bull. All of Bill's, Uncle Bill's bulls were named Jim. <laughs> and he said, I can remember so many times when they're going to go visit Plutz's or Pavlix, he tell Herman, well, go get the car out of the shed, and I'm going to go in the barn and throw Jim some hay at. And this is uh, Hulda Bocek, my dad's sister, up in Saskatchewan, and uh, her youngest son, Clarence. And, uh, and they said on a card, there was a pony that just happened to come, past, come to live with him. And he stayed there a couple weeks, and then they, they found the owner for it. So... That's uh, Uncle Joe and Aunt Hulda. Okay. My dad and mother went up, and my sister Gertie went up to Canada in 1938. And uh, they got <clears throat> this picture. My dad is on the left, and Gertie's in here. And uh, <clears throat> the fellow standing there at Mr. Brown. And what that is is, uh, oh, back up. <coughs> what that is is, in the, in, the, in the 30s, uh, there was the dust storms, depression up in Canada, same as it was in the United States, and they had six years of failed crops. Times were very, very tough, and uh, a lot of farmers couldn't make it, and the ones that had a little, any money left at all, they, they certainly couldn't waste it away uh, putting gas in a Model T. <clears throat> so what they did, they took the, the radiator and the motor and the transmission out of it and put a horse pull back on to use it like for a buggy. And it was... It was uh, dubbed the Bennett Wagon because it was Prime Minister Bennett was the Prime Minister of Canada at that time, at Saskatchewan. So, that's that. Okay, here's my family. Uh, that's my grandma in the middle with the apron on. And that's Frank Pavlik on the right. And Mary Pavlik, his wife Mary way on the left, and then my mother and Gert and then Uncle Bill. Oh, this is, this is Gert and myself. I, I'm the little one. <laughs> As you can see, I must have been wearing hand-me-downs already. <clears throat> but I wanted to, I picked this picture because I wanted to show you what a milk cart was. That was, <clears throat> that was a milk cart. In the early, in very early years, you, you had to put your milk cans on a sleigh or a buggy and, and take them to the cheese factory. But then later on, when van camps come into, into Sturgeon Bay, <coughs> they had uh, trucks that come out and pick you up, pick up the milk. But they wouldn't go to, into your yard because the, in the spring, the yards were too muddy. And in the winter, they didn't, uh, you didn't have snow blowers or snow plows, so they didn't want to come and get stuck. So you had to put your milk out on the stand, out by the road. That was your obligation. So in the, in the summertime, you could use a, a cart like so, and in the wintertime, you use a sleigh. They made that cart out of, out of a buggy axe and <coughs> built the, uh, <coughs> bent the U in that so it was nice and low and slung. Okay. Okay, here's a milk stand. What I'm talking about, the buggy is, I mean, a cart is sitting right alongside. 
and the milk cans are up there. The, the milk truck would drive right alongside, put your, pick up your full cans and set your empty cans out. And that's Herman up on top, playing his accordion. And my dad is sitting on the thing. I think he's playing with a future parts for a violin. Isn't, don't they make violin strings out of cat gut? Okay, here's my, here's my mother and myself and my sister Gertie. That's me and Gert. Okay, that's me. I'm the happy wanderer. <clears throat> and uh, I was about that age when uh, Uncle Bill was going to take that old truck and go make, fix some fence. So I asked, I had to go along with him. So I went along and then he'd asked me to go back to the truck and bring a, some, some staples or some wire or something. And, and I, had, I just had that time, my mother had bought me a brand new straw hat and I was wearing it. And uh, then Bill asked me, how do you like your new straw hat? Uh, I said, it's, it's too hot. And he said, let me see, let me look at it. Oh yeah, I suppose he said that it's, it's so tightly woven that your air can't get out of your hat. So he reached in his pocket, he gets his jackknife out one little blade is real sharp. He cut a hole right in the top of my head about the sight, not quite as big as a golf ball. <laughs> so that's what happened to my little hat my mother bought for me. <laughs> oh, that's my dad and myself. My mother also took the picture. That's my dad in 1952. He's carrying a pail of water to water the chickens on the place that I'm living now. That's my mother, my big tree in the woods. Okay, here we're thrashing behind the homestead barn. That's my Aunt Adeline way to the left. She was, a, she was Pat Hogan's daughter. She married Herman. Herman, Herman Jr. is in the next to her. We were pitching bundles in the machine. And that's me up on top. My dad's teaching me to, how to run the machine, I guess. And that's my dad standing by the weir. And Uncle Bill is way, in, way on the ground, sacking the grain. Okay, and here is uh, Uncle Bill to the left. Then behind him was his uh, lifetime friend, Eddie Bogenschutz. And now, Eddie Bogenschut, yeah, they, I think they were exactly the same age. But Eddie Bogenschut lived just a half a mile to the, to the east of the Geisel Farmstead. But uh, then he moved to Minneapolis and he became an engineer on the locomotive of the Sioux Line. <coughs> and that was a time that the United States was in not having good relationships with Germany. And they didn't like him to have a German name like that, so he changed his name to McKee. And uh, that's the way it stayed. In his retirement years, he moved back to Egg Harbor and lived by, close to his brother Francis. And uh, that's my Uncle Herman next to him, my Grandma Geisel, and Adeline, Herman's wife, Herman Jr.'s wife. Oh, back that up one time. I got a <laughs> Uncle Bill and, and uh, Eddie McGee. They were always, or Eddie Bogenschutz. They were always uh, kind of tricksters. And Bill told me one time they were down by the creek looking for f suckers, and uh, they had their spears. And then he said there was three or four girls come walking down the road, and they hollered at him, "Come on down here! Look at all the fish down here!" So they all come down there, and they were all. He had all the girls lined up looking for fish. Bill was on one end, and Eddie on the other. And Bill said, "All once I felt." Eddie's spear handle hit me in the back, and then, well, then they knew what to do. They told, they looked, and he, one push, they both shoved them all in the water. Oh. <laughs> okay, here's my dad uh, and Herman having a cool one. <clears throat> Certain times of year, they'd buy a little keg of beer, and like, uh, I don't know, Christmas or, well, this is summertime or fall. Maybe 4th of July, I don't know. And here's Herman chopping with our first chopper. Chopping hay, the farm all in. Okay, and here they're unloading it. There was no cell phone loaders. You had to lift up the end gate in the back and hook it off into the into the blower. And here's my dad's first combine, little Massey Harris. Okay, here's a what a picture of my sister Vione and her husband Ronnie Bino. That's my brother Roy. Way on the left, my brother Roy, way on the left, and my Uncle Herman, my Aunt Adeline, 
and uh, the, the bride and groom, and then I, I'm in the, the next one, and Uncle Bill and my sister Gertie. And let's see, they've, they've all passed on except me and my brother Roy. Okay. Here's Uncle Bill. I was taken, I believe, right in 1965 or 66. In the spring, I was planting oats, and Bill would stay with the truck, and he'd always have my, when I'd come around and need a fill, he'd have the bags of fertilizer ready to be dumped in, and that blue can that had the grass seed in, and then he had the bags of oats all untied, ready to pour in, and when I was, when I left, and he'd, if there was a stone laying there, he'd throw it on the truck, as you can see. And my, Shirley, my wife, she brought uh, Bill, a, I think it was a bowl of chili and a sandwich, if I'm not mistaken. And he's sitting there having that. Okay, here's Christmas time, and it's my family. In the, in the front is Wade, Tara, and Jamie, and Jody on the left on top, Shirley and I, and Heidi. Okay. These are, uh, these are all my cousins up in Canada. These are Joe and Hulda's family. <coughs> They're on the bottom. She had six boys. There was Roy, Floyd, Arnold, Harold, Ernie, and Clarence. And up above them, the same way, there was Roy's wife, Myrtle, and Irene, and Teresa, and Lucille, and Eunice, and Marlene. They're, and they're all gone. Oh, here's my daughter and her, her family, uh, Jesse Shartner and, and Jody, my daughter, and uh, Emily and Riley. Here's the Henschels, Mike and Jamie, and Kevin and Mark and Brian. And here's Era, Aaron and Tara LeClaire and Emily. I mean, Elena and, and Reed. <laughs> and that's, we're back to the homestead. I guess that concludes it, huh? Well, at this time, I'd like to thank the, the Sevastopol Historical Society for giving me the opportunity to, to have you go back in time and meet my family. And, uh, I guess if there's any questions, we could see if I could field them. Bernie, I thought you said that they, they were shearing a horse. Was they shearing a horse in that one picture? Yeah. And why did they do that? Or well, I suppose it had his winter coat on and get, get making it cooler. I don't know. Okay. Oh, I think. Keep them cooler. Okay. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's right, Judy, or not. But my mother-in-law told me one time, if you don't know the answer, make something up. <laughs> Thank you. We saw they, they got the logs out of our, our swamp, and then they took it, and they had mills come over later on, but before that they took the mills, uh, they took the logs down to Velmi and they saw it down there. I got a little picture here of, of a thrashing crew, and on the, on the sister died this summer, and she had it, and I'm trying to find out where that was and what time it was. Now, them are different wagons, them wagons are all pitched. A tip, yeah. No, I couldn't help you here. That's totally. That's running with a steam engine here. Yeah. And that's um, seventeen men on there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wish I could help you out. It's a nice picture. Bernie. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, when did you? When did your family switch from horses to the tractors? I mean, you had really early tractors there. So when? One was in 1937 at F12, you seen with the grain drill. 
<coughs> that was our, I think that was the one that tractor that got rid of the horses. Because it's, uh, two years later they sold the last horse. They bought the farm all in 1941 and there was no need for the horses anymore, they left them go. <coughs> and the team was a very good team and it had, it had done no wrong for the Geisels. And my Uncle Bill told me he went along with, uh, I believe it was Bill Jarman. Uh, down to the fox farm because he wanted to see him put down that somebody else wouldn't buy him and uh, and hurt him. They wanted to. It was the end. So. Anybody else? Yep. Did you guys, uh, did you guys always uh, raise dairy cattle? Or did you Do I have dairy cattle? Did you always have dairy cattle? Yeah, the guys always had dairy cattle. So, what area is Saskatchewan? Where are your relatives? What area? What town? Hod Hodgeville. Hod Hodgeville, Saskatchewan. I think a town that's a little bigger than that, close by, is Mor Morris. It's prairie. Huh? It's about a prairie land. Oh yeah, that's prairie land, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you tell, tell the story of why you've got so many pictures? Oh, the reason I got so many pictures is because when my dad, when my dad moved to Canada to live with his sister, he, for some reason or other, he was only 17 years old and he bought a camera, which was really kind of an extravagant thing for a young kid to buy it when it was cameras were not available like, like they are now. But he took pictures that he thought were worthy of taking a picture of and he de developed them himself. He had it come with some kind of kit, I suppose, and, and he did that. So that's why we got them pictures. Really. Really fortunate he did that, or else he wouldn't have nothing to go by. So I hope he's all enjoyed them pictures. I mean, they're definitely.